This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program in America that you, the viewer, can use your voice on the child welfare system. I am Dennis Lawrence, and beside me is the lovely Maria Milene, our co-host. Maria, what do we have up first for our audience? We have an incredible program for you today. We're going to start by looking at the child uh, welfare system and I think we'll begin, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Legally Kidnapped. Hi, Dr. Phil. I really don't feel like talking today. But if you've got a problem... Oh, I've got a problem, all right. I just don't feel like talking about it. What is the deal? It's all of you stupid grown-ups thinking that you know what's best for me. That's not really an answer. I have decided to run away from my foster home. This is not a good solution. That I want to go home. But this just seems so wrong to me. But I still want to go home. That environment is dangerous. Oh, in what way? At so many different levels. Well, I hate to tell you this, Dr. Phil, but that child protective worker lied. Can you imagine that? Oh, I can imagine a lot of things. Can you imagine living in a house where an agency comes in and says you can't be in the same house with your kids? No, but I remember the day the agency came in and said, baby, okay, you can't be in the same house with your parents. I talk about it as one of the seven worst days of your life. Yeah, well, it pisses me off. I, I know you're outraged. And I miss my mommy. It takes a while to get over having someone cut out of your life so permanently. Yeah, I know. They won't even let me see my parents. You need to ask for supervised visitation. I did, dumbass, and the worker keeps saying that we'll work on it, but it never happens. You're probably being told exactly what you want to hear. No, what I really want to hear is this. Baby, okay, we realize that we screwed up and you can go home now. But that won't happen, and I'll never understand why I'm stuck in this stinking foster home. If accusations are made about a child being molested or a child being abused, we have to assume that it's true until it's proven otherwise. But it's not true. It was all a lie orchestrated by a vindictive neighbor who was mad at my daddy for something stupid. Don't come out and negate the whole experience by defending it and saying that he was a victim. I mean, come on. Well, what am I supposed to do? Just play into your little scam? If you've had the problem in your childhood, you've been traumatized, victimized, somebody's been violent with you. But I wasn't victimized or traumatized until they took me away, and my daddy is innocent. It was a false accusation. And I think it's terrible if somebody is falsely accused. I do. Why me, Dr. Phil? Why did this have to happen to me? And why did they have to take me away? I mean, if if they decided, okay, you know what? You're not safe here. We're putting you in foster care. But I was safe there. You say, well, how do we know? How do we know? Because I'm telling you. Because I'm telling you. You know, it's never fun to talk about losing somebody you love. Well, what's going to happen to my daddy? And they're wanting to register as a child abuser. What does that mean? He's toast. Oh, man, this is terrible. It has such an impact because we care so much. Yeah, well, you know what I'm going to do? You feel like crying, cry. You oh, I'm done crying. You feel like screaming, scream. Not this time, buddy. You do what works for you. Yeah, well, I'm going to fight them. I'm going to fight to get back to my parents. You can wind up with results you don't want. What do you mean? I mean, it, this can spin out of control so fast, it's unbelievable. So what? I'm going to kick me some caseworker butt. But there's a point at which it goes so far on the continuum that it becomes rage. So what? They destroyed my family. That is terribly traumatic for that child. That's what I've been trying to tell you. That's a big deal. Give yourself a little time. Give yourself a break. Why can't I just go back to my family? Because when your family's gone, they're gone. You know what, Dr. Phil? 
This isn't going anywhere. I don't want to talk anymore. This is the time that everything can come bubbling up. Just shut up, okay? And I'm going to get on that soapbox every chance I get him. He's not even listening to me. You know, one of the things we have to do in our society is protect our children. See what I mean, people? I'm not being protected. I was stolen. When children are taken away from a parent, I mean, just like that. It destroys lives. We'll see you next time. Every week, we feature a guest that comes and tells their horror story from the family court system or CPS. If you would like to be a guest on our program and tell your story, please email us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. Once again, that's m-i-p-a-r-e-n-t-a-l-r-i-g-h-t-s at gmail.com. Com. Please include guest in the description. Um, the only way we can make an impact is by bringing these stories to light and showing what is taking place in the system. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this week's guest. Um, I am happy to introduce our guest today is Jessica Mullins, and she lives in Holland, Michigan, but her case is out of Allegan, Michigan. So welcome, Jessica. Welcome, Jessica, to the show. It's an honor to have you on today. Um, I know that you have kind of a really difficult, horrific story that you are willing to share, and we appreciate that. Um, the first question I guess I have for you is how did you enter the court process in the CPS system? I entered the, um, the court system in Allegan County through um, an incident with my son and I. We were the victims of a violent crime. And we were brought into the system at DHS in Allegan. And I was charged with improper supervision. Okay. And I have two older children and they were, I was charged for anticipated abuse and neglect on my older two children. So I have two olders and a little one. So basically they said that they thought in the future you might abuse or neglect your Correct. children yes. so this was a reason to give you a hard time and um, to bring me into the jurisdiction of the department of human services for charges and to be put on a registry for improper supervision correct yep and i and i've heard about that anticipated abuse and neglect and i think that's just insane myself but i apologize you've been forced to go through that um did you but you know, before that, did you have any prior involvement with uh, DHS or with uh, the system? Um, prior till 2011, the only involvement that I've had with DHS was I was a foster child growing up, and I also had fueled me to become a foster parent and to offer respite to my home for those that are in the system. And so I was a foster parent and I also did respite for a couple of years. And that was pretty much my experience with DHS until I was entered the system in, in 2011. So basically, at one point in time, uh, DHS made the determination that you were a good parent and you should take in foster children because you had a lot to offer them. They did, yes. They thought that not only was I a fit parent, um, but that I could offer the um, nurturing and the physical well-being and, and to just give that uh, resting place for children who otherwise are in the system and have nowhere to go and that need that respite. And I, they, did, they did a home study and they did interviews and analysis and financial analysis. And um, they, they approved me to be a foster mother and for a respite. 
Okay, so I don't want to take up too many times with just small details that not really small in your instance mm -hmm. because they felt you were fit. How many foster children did you foster through the years? Well, I did three in the original for the first family. I did two others through them, through the mm -hmm. respite program, and I did two through mm -hmm. the uh, foster care. One of them was a relative placement. Okay. So just quick question. I just have to throw this, this in here. Um, do you believe you should have ever been taken to court in the first place? And how do you feel as, as a former foster parent and as far as a former foster child, how do you believe that this could have been handled differently with your <clears throat> case with your children? Well, it should have been heard more. I think the case could have been advocated more. I could have, uh, in my situation, my um, legal counsel was a public defender. Mm -hmm. I um, am very sick, I'm in disability, and so my public defender's advice um, was misinformed, and so it was a claim mm -hmm. of ineffective counsel. I didn't know this until two years later. Um, she had me sign off, voluntarily sign off rights, and I did so, um, not knowing that it was irrevocable and permanent, that I could never get those back. And I did not know about that until later on. Uh, two years the children remained with me until uh, August of last year, I called CPS and found out that I was no longer their parent. And so that prompted me to do a little research and investigation about how many other claims are out there for ineffective counsel and how many termination of rights and what are the statistics on these children, on these silent voices that are out there that want to be advocated for and are unable to do so. And so I, got the, I was very surprised at, our statistics, at the statistics that I found for Michigan as well as nationwide. Well, one question I have before we go into the statistics and the information that you have is, um, did the Child Protective Service System or did anybody involved in that tell you that your injuries or your disability made you unable to take care of the children or was this something that was not even discussed? <clears throat> no, that wasn't discussed with me. My disability, um, the trauma, I think as well, from the abuse. My son and I, he was a newborn, and we both, my son and I both were the victim of a very, a very violent crime. And so during the court process, it moved very mm -hmm. fast and very quickly. And I trusted my counsel, my public defender. And so that never really came up at all. Um, she did at one point, my attorney did at one point look at me and say, are you on state assistance? And I stopped and I said, yeah, why? What does that have to do with anything? And she says, that's why they're going after your rights. That's why they're gonna terminate and go after your rights. And I just thought, gosh, that's not nice. And then, and then later I found out that that's discrimination yes. and that they sh that should not have happened. Well, unfortunately also when they take your children away and they place them in another uh, a foster home or something like that, <clears throat> they are also getting state assistance there. So to me, this makes absolutely no sense for them to use that as an excuse to remove children from a fit parent. Um, a common complaint we receive is lack of representation in court as you, you know, stated. There's um, there's a whole lot of people, especially indigent. I myself am indigent and dealt with the same type of issues you're dealing with in the same court, as a matter of fact. And you know, not yes, to make you had a, said that. Yeah, yeah, not to make too much of a big deal about that, but that's sure. something that we certainly have in common. Um, this is something that you've been looking into. Um, can you elaborate some on that topic of what you've been doing and what? Absolutely. Um, what I found out during the, uh, the fallout of what my rights are, I found out that out of all of the cases that come about um, statistics-wise, that at any given time, 
there's about 400,000 children waiting in foster care uh, for placement. And of those, uh, Michigan ranks number five. And so I thought about an effective counsel, and I wonder how much that played upon theirs because being poor and having an effective counsel, the standard that is applied um, from my experience, from what I've learned, it's been a struggle to advocate for myself. But I've learned that the, the model that is applied to circuit court for DHS is based on a criminal procedure model. Module, model. Yeah, so absolutely. the legal vehicle is based on criminal, but yet at this point, with the voluntarily waiver of my rights, a criminal has more rights, a murderer has more rights for justice than I do to advocate for my children. And that is not, that is something is wrong. Yeah. My children call me, they want to come home. But I have to tell them and explain to them that my attorney had me sign this and I didn't, wasn't clear on it and now there's nothing I can do. So I've had to really, really advocate and research what a person, what we can do as parents after our rights have been terminated, how we can still speak up and put that word out there to offer that light to other parents who may be struggling and in, in dealing with the fallout um, from their rights being gone, especially with an ineffective counsel. Just, just so you are, you are aware, um, there's parents who have not had their parental rights terminated, such as me. I have joint legal custody, but I haven't seen a couple of my children in two years. So it's not uncommon. I, I don't believe that what you did as far as signing a piece of paper is what um, made a huge impact on what happened because that happens to a lot of parents who maintain their rights um, which is completely and totally illegal in Michigan by the way um, no parent should be kept from a child without abuse or neglect and signing a piece of paper certainly does not constitute that right um, what else do you see as far as um, you know, I know you've been researching. What else do you have for maybe the view out, viewers out here who don't know where to turn or, you know, I know you've put a lot of work into this. What information could you give them as far as helping themselves and, you know, helping their own cases? I think the biggest um, advice is to not give up and that, that that light is out there. It is the reason this show exists. And to put that hope out there and don't give up. You know, we're, there's no such thing as a perfect parent. I wasn't a perfect parent, but I always tried. And I never gave up. Yeah. And even with my rights being gone, I still have not given up. I still insist on being, you know, hopeful and inspirational and knowing that this is all for a reason. And so I would really advise other parents that are struggling with the DHS and the court systems to not give up. Do not give up. Carry that love inside you like a light. Keep going and keep digging. Keep doing research and reach out to those who also share your story and bring awareness to the legal system. I think it's especially important for us, those of us who, um, like you and I, have dealt with the same court system, have dealt with the same judges. We have. To really get together and. That's very important. The more people that we can, you know, that come to us, and I've had many come to me also from the same court system, it makes our case a lot stronger when we've got other people that can say, hey, this person is not making this up. I've been through the same thing. And, and it's really unfortunate for all the children that are dealing with this and they have no, they have nobody fighting for them because so many parents can't keep up. They struggle with mm -hmm. the, the amount of stress and especially yes. when you're coping with a disability on That's top correct. of it. Yes. It's the, the post-traumatic stress disorder. It's incredibly hard to keep fighting, but that's the only thing that's gonna make a difference in this system. Now, mm -hmm. you know, just another quick question. What have you been working on to advocate for clients um, that could help others? Well, um, 
You know, I, this has taken a lot of prayer and a lot of fellowshipping with other parents um, and just um, reading the news and reaching out to people who, to other parents that are single, who are unwed, who have small children and just basically saying, how are you doing? You know, mm -hmm. what's going on with you and your children? Do you need help? And hearing the stories from the homeless shelter, the city mission, of the poverty and the DHS involvement. And so one of the things that I also did is there's no legal resource for us to get out and do that. If you go to the self-help and the legal help on um, michigan.gov, there's nowhere to file a claim. To, to be heard, there's no legal vehicle. And so one of the things that I did <coughs> was I had contacted the, um, the SCAOs, that the Michigan Administrative, mm -hmm. and I, I just, I wrote a letter to the trial serv the court services division of the state court administrative offices for the Michigan Court Forms Committee. And I, I wanted to show them the need for this law to be changed. And so I gave them a proposal and addressed it to Colin and I said, um, I put in the statistics for the adoption and foster care as well as the right to counsel and the claims of ineffective counsel and um, what happens after that. And so I'm asking that this be aware and to be noticed and recognized that we have a wonderful country, we live in a wonderful nation, and if these little quirks, these little things, which seem very huge because it involves our children mm -hmm. and we're parents, if we can fix them and figure out how to make it run better and smoothly so that there is justice for the poor, yeah. you know, then that would be wonderful. You know, it's Martin Luther King Day. He was all yeah. about equality. Yep, absolutely. And one of the things that I've come up with that I've, that I've discovered among my peers and the people that I work with is that it's really difficult to work on your own case because you're so emotionally involved and it's hard to separate um, you know your emotions from your particular case so if we're jumping and helping each other yes. that decreases yes. you know I can tell somebody else you got to do this 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 and this but when it comes to my case I tend to be just That's a very basket true. case. <laughs> that is very true. Um, and I do find that that helps. And just thinking on all this, that I was so alone and I was so isolated that I was really surprised when I went on the website. Um, it's at uh, Michigan Kids for Foster Care. And I learned that there are approximately 14,000 Michigan children, this is today's uh, January 20th date of 2014, approximately 14,000 Michigan children are in foster care at any given time. This is yeah. only Michigan. Uh, and these, this isn't a number, these are 14,000 voices who want to come home, who want their mother, who want their father. 14,000 children uh, who need to be advocated and listened for, and they start by the parents. You listen to the parent, and you defend them, and you bring their voice into court, and you give them a voice, because mm -hmm. when they, the council fails us, it fails our children. So 14,000 of them. Um, and when they can't be returned home, then they get into the adoption system. And so they get into the adoptive uh, care, and then they begin waiting there. And so there's actually statistics for how long a child waits in the adoption care, waiting to be adopted. They right. sit there, and they wait. Yep, and that's that's not a pleasant experience for any child to be no. stuck there with people they don't know. And um, a lot of family members are getting turned away and not allowed to yes. raise the children for the simple fact that they don't have enough money or various other reasons that are not really reason. Because in, in my firm belief, it takes more love to raise a child than it does money you can make it, you know, you can make it. There's help out there. One other there is, yes. One, one thing I wanted to ask you about real quick is that have you ever been told to contact, contact the Judicial Tenure Commission? And if so, what was the result of that? 
No, I have not been told that. I'm very new into this since August, so I've never heard of that. I haven't had any help, really. I had nowhere to go and didn't know what to do in August when the children were removed. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what okay. to do. And so a lot of this time I've been calling, trying to find direction, and I've been hearing that there's a lot of ineffective counsel claims, that they're just not being listened to and advocated for. Well, one of the issues that we're having with parents in, in the court system and when they do contact the Judicial Tenure Commission, the issue we're having is that it takes at least a year to um, for them to do anything, to change anything, and that, you know, by that time the children are confused. They've been out of your care for yes. a year. Um, and just also wanted to add that this is not a Michigan issue, you guys. This is happening all over the country. And I really appreciate you coming and sharing your story with us. Absolutely. Um, You're so welcome. I really, I, I want to talk to you more. Yeah. And I hope that we get to do another segment with you because I think that you have a lot more information to offer. I do have a bit more information. So it was great to meet you and I look forward to seeing and hearing from you again. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Oh, yeah. Hello, I'm a child protective worker. I want to thank you for watching this week's edition of Silent Voices. You can tune in next week, same time and same channel. If you'd like to be a guest on our program or just give us feedback, please contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. Again, that's M-I-P-A-R-E-N-T-A-L-R-I-G-H-T-S dot com. We also have a social network I'd like you to join, and that is at miparentalrights.ning.com. Dot com. That's miparentalrights.ning.com. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice, voice can, can make, make a the difference. difference.